So we're going to be in Romans 5 today, but we're going to get there by way of Luke 15. So right in the middle of, of the 15th chapter of the Gospel of Luke, we hear this story. There was a man who had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the property that will belong to me. In other words, I wish you were dead so I can get my money. So the father divided his property between them. A few days later, the younger son gathered all he had and traveled to a distant country, abandoning his family. And there he squandered his family inheritance in dissolute living. When he had spent everything, a severe famine took place throughout that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country, who sent him to his field to feed the pigs. He would gladly have filled himself with the pods that the pigs were eating, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired hands have bread enough and to spare? But here I am, dying of hunger. I'll get up, go to my father, I'll say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me like one of your hired hands. So he set off and went to his father. But while he was still far off, instead of barring the gates in repulsion and disgust, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. He ran and put his arms around him and kissed him. Then the son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quickly, bring out a robe, the best one, and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. And get the fatted calf and kill it. And let's eat and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. Now the elder son was in the field, working hard. And when he came and approached the house, he heard music and dancing. He called one of the servants and asked, what's going on? He replied, your brother has come and your father has killed the fatted calf because he's got him back safe and sound. Then he came angry refused to go in. His father came out and began to plead with him. He answered his father, Listen, for all these years I have been working like a servant for you. I have never disobeyed your command, yet you have never even given me a young goat so that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came back, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fatted calf for him. Then the father said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that's mine is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice, because this brother of yours was dead and has come to life. He was lost and has been found. And now Romans 5. Paul says to the Christians in the city of Rome, Therefore, since we are justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have obtained access to this grace in which we stand, and we boast in our hope of sharing the glory of God. And not only that, but we also boast in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, 
and character produces hope. And hope does not disappoint us because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit that's been given to us. For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. Indeed, rarely will anyone die for a righteous person. Though perhaps for a good person, someone might actually dare to die. But God proves his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more surely then, now that we've been justified by his blood, will we be saved through him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more surely, having been reconciled, will we be saved by his life. But more than that, we even boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we've now received reconciliation. That text from the middle of Romans um, is not easy or simple, much like the rest of the book. Uh, and if there's, if there's any book in Scripture for which the original setting is important for trying to make some sense out of it, it's Romans. In particular, one of the things that, that seems to be in the background of the book, the book of Romans, is that Paul wrote to a bunch of Christians in the city of Rome in the late first century. And in that time and in that place, you have Jewish Christians, converts from Judaism to Christianity, and you have pagan Christians who had converted from paganism to Christianity. And all of them are trying to get along together in these house churches scattered across the city. Now, if that background, if, those, if that difference between their backgrounds weren't enough, you add on top of that the fact that, that Rome is a hub in the empire for people from across the known world. And then on top of that, in the middle of the first century, the emperor, thinking that the Jews were creating tension in the city, had issued an edict expelling all the Jews from the city. And to the Romans, the category Jew included the Christians. They just saw the Christians as another sect, like Pharisees or Sadducees. And so they expelled them all together. Jew, like what we normally think of as Jews and also the Jewish Christians. And so for several years, half a decade, the effect of this was that the Gentile Christians are running things all alone in the churches in Rome. When the edict is reversed and all of those Jews come flooding back into the city, we can easily imagine that this would create some tension, right? It's like the guests in the house being left on their own for half a decade, not knowing if the owners will ever be back. They've taken over the place. They've probably made some changes while the owners have been gone. By the time Paul writes this letter, these groups have come back together and they're struggling to get along. Each thinks the place belongs to them. That, very briefly, is the setting for the book of Romans. That's why Paul wrote this letter. He's trying to, to speak into that tension. It's the people in that situation who are receiving Paul's letter. But there's another context that's vital here, the theological context. Notice what Paul talks about when he writes this letter. He doesn't just offer like a Hallmark card or just sort of generic advice about being nice to each other, right? He launches into this incredibly dense, difficult, almost impenetrable reflection on the essence of the gospel, the nature of sin, what God has done in Christ in response to this situation in Rome. One of the things that's crucial here is that one of Paul's working assumptions, which he lays out at the beginning of the book of Romans, 
he says in chapter 3, we have already charged that all, both Jews and Greeks, are under the power of sin. As it is written, there is no one who is righteous, not even one. There's no one who has understanding. There's no one who seeks God. All have turned aside. Together, they have become worthless. There's no one who shows kindness, not even one. Their throats are open graves. That's a pretty grotesque image. Their throats are opened graves, he says. They use their tongues to deceive. The venom of vipers is under their lips. Their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Ruin and misery follow in their wake, or in their paths. And the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. These are pretty strong words. And they're basically the opening words for the book. They're the, the heart of the opening section of Romans. But it's important to be careful in hearing what he's talking about here. It's important, I think, in particular, to, to be careful about how we think about sin. His working assumption is that contrary to both the Jewish Christians and the, the Gentile Christians, who are hearing this letter read to them in the late first century, all of them are in this mess together, he's saying. Contrary to what each group thinks. Contrary to all the finger pointing. He's saying we all love and worship the love of other things. We lift up created things, things not worthy of our devotion, and we turn toward them as sources of hope. What grows out of this kind of devotion is corrupted love, a love that twists in on itself, unable to be sustained. And this kind of love turns into hatred and self-centeredness because these other loves are really a love of ourselves, these love of created things. And so this kind of love creates feet swift to shed blood it makes throats into open graves. It fills lips with venom. Instead of words of life, from our mouths comes the stench of death, he says. All of us. Notice the kinds of sins that he's talking about, the forms of viciousness that he's highlighting here. He's not talking about secret, personal sins that are contrary to our own individual personal relationships with Jesus. He's not talking about general feelings of guilt and shame here. These are concrete, wounded, and corrupted relationships. Venom is not a generic, guilty feeling that one has. Venom is something that is directed against the viper's victim. Deceit is aimed at the other and toward one's own gain. But it's more than that. Notice in the language that he's using, the eagerness, the readiness to bring harm and ruin. Feet swift to shed blood. Venom under their lips, he says. There's a deep corruption that has rooted its way down deep into their hearts. But it's important to avoid two extremes here. It's easy to fall into one of two ditches when we're trying to make sense of this stuff. To take too, sin too seriously, which leads to despair, and to take sin not seriously enough, which leads to an overly easy, easy conscience about ourselves, as Reinhold Niebuhr puts it. To take sin not seriously enough is to think about ourselves that the fractures in our lives and our relationships are either not so bad and have simple and easy solutions, so we shouldn't really be concerned about those problems, or maybe that those problems don't exist at all. Maybe sin is not really a thing we should worry about. What others call vices are really not problems at all. Greed is good, as they say. 
Caring about myself first is a good thing. If it's not immediately obvious that my choices and attitudes are harming anybody else, then there's no harm in my actions. If I'm not being intentionally malicious, then I must not be part of the problem. If I'm not being intentionally prejudiced, then I must not be participating in prejudice and inequality. There are many ways to take sin not seriously enough. Or even if I do recognize the problem, it always lies somewhere else than in my own heart and will and mind. But as tempting as that way of thinking is, we're called back again and again to recognize that sin is real and it twists us and fractures us in all our relationships, including our relationship with God. We sin against heaven, as the prodigal son says. And sin has dug, its, has dug ruts deep down within us so that we cannot untwist ourselves. These fractures and ruts, we cannot heal ourselves. So one extreme is to not take sin seriously enough. The other extreme is to go too far in the opposite direction, to take sin too seriously. To take sin too seriously is to think that we have become naturally, inherently sinful, completely sinful and evil. I hear people talking this way sometimes. As if the substance of our very being has become evil somehow. We come to think of ourselves as disgusting and repulsive, worthy of only hatred and loathing and contempt, even from God. But that's not right either. When God, when God called the creation that God had made good, God spoke truly. God called it good. Sin does not break or ruin us. Sin does not make good things into evil things. Good things are, that are harmed or wounded or stained or torn are still those same good things. Even when they're wounded and stained and torn, they're still those same good things. They don't cease to be those good things. It's just that they need healing and cleaning and repair. There is a wound, a misstep, a way of being together and in relationship to God that is corrupted and turned away from life and real love. And these wounds and fractures are serious, but they're not victorious. They're not final and total. They're not ruinous. They're just in need of the sort of healing that we cannot provide for ourselves, the sort of cleaning that we cannot accomplish ourselves. We can't forgive our own sins because our sins are not against ourselves, they're against God. But they can be forgiven. We can be healed. We are healed and made whole and clean in Christ. God has acted decisively through the death and the life of Christ and through the giving of God's Spirit to make us whole and sanctify us, to bring us into God's own life and love. God has told us that we may come home to the feast. God has offered love and grace. One of my favorite passages from a German theologian named Helmut Thielicke is from his reflection on the story of the prodigal son. He asks, reflecting on God's work in Christ, in light of that story, Thielicke says, Quote, is he not the light that shines in the darkness? Is he not the loving voice? The German word there is, is Herzstimme, which literally means heart voice. The sun is the heart voice. I like that. The heart voice of God. Who seizes us in the middle of the distant place with this joyful news. You may come home. End quote. Christ is that welcoming divine message. You may come home. And this book, Romans, this is not a book of fear and condemnation, just the reverse. It's a message of hope. God has run to the gate and embraced us in the deepest way, welcoming us home in Christ. But there's one more difficult lesson here. 
the lesson of the older brother. In fact, Jesus tells that story to get to that part of the story about the older brother. God has welcomed us to the table, but God has also called us to welcome others, to come to the party, to join that feast as others are welcomed in as well. While we were still sinners, Paul says, God has acted to reconcile us with God. The table doesn't belong to us. What's more, God has called on us to be reconciled with each other, to be God's ambassadors of reconciliation in the world. Which is why in 2 Corinthians 5, and I'll close with this, Paul proclaims to the Christians in Corinth, he says, all this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting the, the message of reconciliation to us. So, we are ambassadors for Christ, since God is making his appeal through us. Let's pray together. God, you are holy. You are full of mercy and love. From you we receive all the good things that we possess, all the good things that we are. Pray that you would fill us with your spirit and bind us together, energize us, to come to the feast and to invite others as well, to be as welcoming with each other as you are with us. We pray all things through Christ our Lord. Amen.